and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. I'm Marshall, your host, and today we've got a sweet one. This is a Rolex Datejust, and this is the first time I've ever worked on a Rolex. I just didn't really have enough confidence yet <laughs> to actually open up a watch this nice. I got this one off of eBay. It is not working. Um, it was not clear from the description about <laughs> exactly what its condition was as far as working goes. Honestly, it's kind of a sketchy one, but uh, today you and I get to explore this watch together and see what's inside of a Rolex and why they're so special, or if they're so special. First things first, of course, we need to, uh, to open up the case and let's see what's inside. Hey, not too bad at all. There's some weird markings on the inside of the case, probably from a watchmaker. And as you can see, this has an automatic movement and it looks like the balance wheel is trying to go. Although this is the winding rotor for the automatic works and it seems okay, I don't know. I noticed right away that there's a screw missing there from that bridge. And I figure let's just get into it. So first things first, uh, we're gonna take the winding stem out and then that'll allow us to remove the movement from the case and you can see that Balance wheel is trying to go, but it can't. And uh, these movements kind of come out in a weird way, but anyway, there it goes. And well, the dial actually looks pretty good. It's a champagne dial, which is a pretty popular type of dial for a watch like this from the 60s. And I can't really see exactly what's going on with this just yet. But overall, it looks like it's in pretty good shape. So let's get those hands off. Use this uh, plastic bag just to make sure that the dial doesn't get scratched. And then I've got these little hand levers that are, I think, the best way to remove hands. Also have these special tweezers with the, uh, the tips. They're not made of metal. And that way you can pick up hands without fear of scratching them. Although the tweezers are a little clunky to use because they don't grip as well as metal. So next we're gonna take the dial off of this watch and that'll allow us to start to get in. Interesting stuff, uh, Rolex. Uh, we'll be talking about Rolex a bit today, uh, my thoughts on it. And also I really wanna get into one of these and kind of get an idea for why they're so special, why, they're, why people love them so much. So let's get this automatic winding rotor off of here first because that'll allow us to actually see the rest of the movement. And there we go. So that comes away and we can look inside and all told, well, I'm relieved right, oh, oh no. <laughs> so there's the problem. Uh, there's the missing screw. It was stuck in the balance wheel. <laughs> not a good start. Uh, not, not, not the best sign for your vintage watch purchase from eBay though. The price was right, so I guess this is the kind of thing I have to suspect. But as I say that, hey, this thing is firing right up and, uh, and that balance wheel seems to be cooking along really nice. So let's let the mainspring down and we can start disassembly of this watch. Well, like I said, it's good news and it's bad news. On, on one hand, the watch works because it was only stuck because of that screw, so maybe I got a better deal because of that. On the other hand, a screw was loose in the case. It probably means it wasn't super well taken care of. So first things first is the balance needs to come off. And straight away, um, you know, just sort of, again, this is the first Rolex I've ever opened up or worked on. Um, just kind of working my way up, uh, get building up my confidence and my skill set. I am an amateur. I'm, this is a hobby for me. I'm not a professional watchmaker. So, uh, you know, one step at a time. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself on something that you can't handle. But I felt like I was ready for this. So, uh, yeah, in we go. And so far, yeah, I can see that this movement looks like, you know, they'd call it a workhorse movement, right? This is a, a movement that is... I think you could describe it as overbuilt. 
but I mean that as a compliment, uh, you know, think military stuff or whatever, right? Where they kind of overdo it for any situation. This movement reminds me of that a little bit. It's got some really beefy stuff going in here. Uh, you, you can take a look at the the spring on the keyless works even, and it has like a beveling around it. And that means it's thick. That isn't just a normal stamped out spring like you see. That In fact, that's the one I'm getting right here. That is a much more substantially built part than you would find in a normal like ETA movement or something like that. Now, I'm not really sure how to approach a movement like this. This is has a lot of the stuff that I'm used to taking out the yoke spring here for the keyless works. But at the same time, it's a little different. Rolex kind of has its own thing. And the rest of the keyless works coming apart here. And so far, so good. No, no major issues outside of that one screw that was floating around the case. So now I'm trying to take apart the motion works, but can't quite figure out exactly how to get that going. So I'm going to flip this thing over and see if I can't get to the train of wheels. So first we'll start with the barrel side. And there's this little tiny retainer spring thing there. And that just is on the top of that second pivot in the middle. And I believe just to keep it in place. And it, of course, jumped away, but it's, it's easy to find that. And these are something that I've always wondered about. That wheel is on an extended pivot. So it's it's only, there's two wheels. There's one below that's actually in the gear train. And then there's that one on top that turns the second hand. But it's just pressure fit on. And I've never really figured out how to get those off. For those of you that have been watching the channel for a while, you'll remember the Omega Seamaster that I did. It has the same setup. And I never figured out how to get that off of there. I ended up just putting it through the cleaning process with that still on because I could never figure it out. It turns out... There is a way to get that off of there, but we'll have to wait for that. When you wind the stem on your watch, that's actually what ends up turning, and then that turns the barrel, which is the thing on the left there. So, so far so good there as well. And now I think we can take off the barrel bridge itself. Oh. Now I do have to be careful because of that extended wheel is up there and I don't want to damage it but it looks like I have plenty of room so I'm going to go ahead and just remove this bridge if I can and there it comes and there it goes but it looks okay again this watch seems to actually be in pretty good shape considering the price I paid and well it's a Rolex Datejust I mean these are this is one of the most popular watches in the world they've been producing these for I don't know, 60 years, 70 years, something like that now. All right, so now we can uh, get the pallet fork out of there. Remember, I let down the main spring. In fact, I've just taken out the main spring. It's in that barrel on the ground. And the pallet fork actually kind of sticks in the pivot, but then it comes out. So I guess that's fine and it looks okay. Now, there's the normal motion work in the middle of the movement there, but then there's that weird thing on that other wheel, and I don't know what it is. And this part comes off too, and I don't know what this is. 
but it looks like a spring or a retainer of some sort. So I decide to try to take apart the parts around that strange wheel and there's this lever and then this actually has a jewel on it that sits on top of the lever. It's actually a clever little piece. And finally I figure out how to get this part off and I think I need a special tool to take this off properly. I ended up using my, my a pair of two pairs of tweezers to do this. And also you'll note that it is, uh, it has those three stripes on the top, which means that it's, it's uh, reverse threaded, but it doesn't have a normal screw slot. So I take that off. Uh, finally, this actually took me a while. And on the bottom, there's a cam. And I realized this must be for the calendar to turn over the calendar. Now it's time to take the cannon pinion off. I've got my cannon pinion remover, which is I think the safest way to do this. I know some people just use tweezers, but that seems like very risky to me to uh, bend the pivot. And with that, I take off the cannon pinion <laughs> and the rest of the train bridge just falls off of the bottom. Well, I guess that's one way to get that out of there. So there's the fourth wheel and the escape wheel. And I'll take that apart. But there's also the automatic works. So if you've ever had an automatic watch, this is what's inside. That's called the winding rotor. And it has a weight at the end and then spins around when your arm moves around. And it turns that motion. It turns those little gears, the two red, you know, kind of magenta gears that are signature to Rolex plus the one in the middle. And it turns that into a little tiny bit of wind for your watch just as if you had turned the crown just a fraction, you know, a quarter of a turn. But every time you swing your arm around, it's a quarter of a turn, a half a turn, and it adds up over the course of, of an hour or whatever. And next thing you know, your watch is all wound up and you don't even have to wind the thing. Of course, Rolex, in their infinite wisdom, has a, a special name for it. They call it a perpetual And this uh, automatic work is pretty robust as well. As you can see, it's heavily jeweled. Jewels, of course, are those red-colored ruby, ruby-colored uh, parts, and those reduce friction and allow lubricant to stay in place a little bit better. And they're also almost as hard as diamonds. They're very easy to produce, and they're actually pretty cheap to produce as well uh, synthetically, much like diamonds. And so the ones that we use in watches these days, all over this movement, in fact, you can see them right there, uh, are synthetic sapphires, technically. And then the color of them is, is what we, like a sapphire and a ruby are basically the same fundamentally. So there you go. There's the automatic work and most of the uh, the trains, the train wheel taken apart, but it's kind of stuck here as you can see. I can't actually get that other wheel off with this wheel stuck on it and this has kind of become an issue. So I'm gonna have to set that aside for now, but it's we also have one more job to do here. We have to get the barrel taken apart and that also allows us to take a look at the mainspring and see how it looks. Sometimes they're broken. Sometimes they're, uh, they call them set, which means that they've lost their springiness. This one is dirty, really dirty. Like it has not been serviced in a very long time. But the spring itself looks like it's in pretty good shape. And this is always kind of an awkward dance that we have to do as watchmakers, but uh, there you go. And the spring looks how it's supposed to look, although it's really dirty. So here's all the parts all laid out. And again, I've still got part of the, um, that wheel still stuck on there, but otherwise, well, you know what? That wasn't the worst. And this watch is actually in pretty good shape. So with that, let's get things back together now. So uh, first things first, watch cleaning machine. So I put the balance back on and then start getting the parts in the basket. 
and every single part goes in there outside of a few. There's a few that don't go through the watch cleaning machine process. Like the dial doesn't go through, the hands don't go through, for example. And ta-da, we're done. So just like that, watch is cleaned and we can get back to reassembling. As you can see, that barrel looks much, much better. Now this is an automatic movement, so I'm putting some what they call braking grease around the outside because Because once the mainspring gets fully wound, remember it's an automatic, it's doing it on its own. If you were to just keep winding and winding and winding, you could damage the mainspring. Much like in a manual wind watch when you kind of hit the end of it and you know I don't need to wind it any further. The way that it works in automatic watches, it actually just slides around the inside of the barrel. But that braking grease can help prevent damage and also make it stick to the wall a little bit better. So I put some of that on and now it's time for the watch winders, the watch winders, the mainspring winders. And that means picking the right one and we're gonna go ahead and put the mainspring on this, uh, this end of it and then this tool will let me wind the mainspring back into a shape that I can actually put it in the, uh, in the barrel again. Doing this by hand is very difficult and risks damaging the mainspring a lot. Like it just, it's almost better to just buy a new one if you're gonna do it that way, but that gets quite expensive, especially when a mainspring is in really good shape like this one. I, I much prefer to just reuse the next, uh, reuse this one. And so you wind it in. And this is a tricky process, but this tool makes it a lot easier. just need to make sure that the tail of this, this is the part that actually hits the wall of the barrel when the automatic watch is wound up enough. And once it's in there all the way, we can take off the winding handle and make sure that it's seated correctly in here. And again, this is all tricky stuff. I'm using brass tweezers here just in case, I don't wanna put a kink uh, in the mainspring. That could hinder its performance. And there we go, looks perfect, all wound up and ready to go. That's exactly what we wanna see. So now it needs to go back in the barrel. And this part, oh, this sound is one of the most satisfying sounds in all of watchmaking. Oh, that's good. That is nice. And now we can put the, uh, the barrel arbor back on. This is what actually gets attached to the rest of the watch so that when you turn those various gears that we talked about before, it actually will turn the, uh, the spring inside of the barrel. Always amazed at main springs is such a simple thing. Just a coiled up piece of metal, but it is responsible for all the power of the entire watch. Anything that's moving, keeping time, dates, anything, is ultimately powered by this mainspring, this one little piece of metal. And put the barrel cap back on and that should be ready to go. Okay, so now we've got the automatic winding works and that needs to get all put back together. So I'm gonna put some lubricant on from a video that I watched to try to replicate that the best I can. These two gears kind of mesh with this one third gear that goes down at the bottom. 
And that's the one that actually interfaces with the watch itself. And then there's a little bridge here that kind of holds all three of those together, again, with jewels. And, you know, going back to the discussion about Rolex and uh, my view on it is that as a brand, Rolex is thought of by most people as being a super fancy watch, right? If, if, if somebody comes up and they go, I got a new watch. Oh, you probably got a Rolex, right? It's just the first name that comes to mind. There's a bit of irony in that uh, for two reasons. One, Rolex certainly did not make its its bones by uh, by being that, by being a fancy watch. They made them, they got their reputation for being a watch, uh, a great watch company, not by being luxurious or fancy, but by, by being robust and useful. Uh, you know, they made a lot of their early stuff was tool watches, watches that people used for different jobs or occupations or uh, maybe even adventures or whatever. Nothing fancy about it. You wouldn't want to be wearing a Rolex to a dinner party. You would wear it on a mountain or diving. But they still garner the reputation for being the best. And they're really good. They really are. They mass produce watches on a huge scale and they keep a level of quality that is absolutely fantastic. All right, so here is the tool that I finally got to take this wheel off. I found this, I finally figured out how to do it. And basically it's like a Presto hand removal tool, but it's it's got different jaws on it so that it's set up to take off the top. And there it is, finally, <laughs> I've gotten it off of there. And that will allow me to put the train wheel bridge back on and then I can put that wheel back on after. So I mentioned the irony about Rolex. Uh, so they made their bones by being robust, reliable tool watches, not fancy stuff. And by the way, I'm putting that wheel back on here. But the funny part is, is that these days, they actually are trying to be fancy. And by the way, I'm trying to put this... <laughs> barrel bridge in and it will not fit. And I'm like, there is something wrong. I've often found that when working on a watch, if something just doesn't feel right about how it's fitting, there's usually something wrong. They, if it's right, they go together pretty nicely. And I realized I had put the barrel arbor in upside down. I tried to check this, but I just missed it. And so I put it in upside down and that was what was preventing me from being able to put that barrel back in. So I'm going to have to do the old thing. Okay, open it back up, take the barrel out, flip it over. Thankfully, I don't have to redo the mainspring or anything. And look at that. You see the difference? It just pops right in when everything's right. And when it's not, it feels like you have to force it. And when you feel like you have to force it, it's best to just take a breath and go, okay, something might not be right here. So I'm going to continue with the barrel side here. The barrel bridge is going on and the ratchet wheel and all that. But yeah, it, Rolex these days, if you try to buy a new Rolex, you will, for all of the popular models, the GMT, the Submariner, certainly the Daytona, and even to a point, a date just like this one, but a modern one, um, you, you and, and the Explorer, you often can't buy them. You, you literally cannot walk into a store and purchase them. And it's been this way for a few years. This has driven the price and demand up a lot. Uh, on the secondary market, they'll sell for 50 to 100% more of their value. I mean, we're talking about double. Like, you, <laughs> if a watch costs $8,000 in the store, you might have to pay 16, you might even have to pay 18 or $20,000 for it third party. Now, it will still be new effectively with the box and the papers and all that. But I believe that Rolex is trying to scale their market up. I think that they're trying to be more exclusive. Um, they're trying to be fancier, if you will, uh, which is certainly their right as a company, but it is not in line with their traditional values where it was more about quality and robustness rather than exclusivity. Interesting move to make, and it has a lot of frustrated customers and a lot of people really wanting to get their hands on one of those watches. So it's kind of a controversial topic in the watch community. In the meantime, I'm impressed uh, by this movement. I really am. Uh, th this to me is an extremely well-designed 
movement. And once I figured out for myself each of these parts, I go, oh, okay, I see why you did it that way. And examining the parts themselves, they're very high quality. They're simple. That These are not, um, there's no fanciness here as far as the design goes. They are trying to be effective. It's that simple. All right, so I'm going to actually take out my staking set here to get this wheel back on. I actually I don't know the proper way to put one of these back on, but I figure that the staking set allows me to at least apply gentle pressure in a more even fashion so that I can reapply this wheel. And yeah, I guess I did it. It's spinning and it's working and I did it. Again, this is just one of those times where I'm learning, you know, I'm still figuring these things out and kind of figuring out what, what works best. Here's the cannon pinion going back on. And that means that we can start working on the motion work and even finish up the keyless work. And then, at least for me, the calendar, which is something that I don't have that much experience with. Now, what's happening here <laughs> is that little circle jewel on that arm that I pointed out earlier, it's gone. And while I was putting in the spring for the calendar work, it broke. This was a huge pain. So I ordered a new spring, as you can see, there it is. And that took a while to get here. And there's the new jewel. So now all of a sudden I'm spending a bunch of extra money. The jewel, I have no idea where it ended up. I put it in the watch cleaning machine. I have that on film. So I know it went into there and I've checked everywhere around it, and it's just gone. Uh, I don't know what I did, but it's obviously on me. I lost it, and I need to just try to get my, my practices as better as I can because this time it cost me some money. But with the new parts here, I can continue my assembly, and that's the part right there that I lost. And again, this is another piece. As you can see, it goes on the bottom of this metal post, and that rubs up against the cam for the calendar so that when it turns over, it's, it clicks over rather than doing it slowly. And the cool part is, again, using a jewel for that means that it'll basically last forever and it can be lubricated better. And most companies, I would say, would just use metal on metal there. And Rolex said, nope, we can put a jewel there uh, in a high friction area and we'll go ahead and do that. And those are the little details that really stand out about this movement. Now, if I could manage to not lose that jewel, I would be even happier, but I, I did and I never found it. It's gone. So this part that's uh, going on now is a it's actually just a retaining spring. It took me a while to figure this out because uh, it's it's it has things that look like screws on it that aren't. <laughs> and it's also kind of a bridge that holds down the other parts as well. So that part I'm pulling back there is spring loaded with that jewel underneath it and it's what pushes on the cam that turns over the date. And there's our new spring in there as well. Yeah, that spring I actually didn't break. It, it, had, it had actually failed. Um, so when I took it out, it, it was already failed, but I didn't notice. And when I put it back in, it wasn't holding the shape in any way. And I'm like, what is going on with this spring? And I realized that it had, uh, it had already failed. So this watch didn't needed some pretty serious work in the end, uh, aside from my, <laughs> the, the work that I created for myself. Again, this is a reverse threaded. I don't even know what to call this. It's not a screw. You can see it has these two kind of holes in the top and I just had to use my tweezers to do it. I'm assuming that there's a special screwdriver or tool that you need for that, but I don't have it as of now. Okay, so that frees up the keyless work to be installed. Now that we've got the motion work on there. So I'm putting a little bit of grease on the clutch wheel here. And I put some on the sliding clutch as well where it engages with the motion work. This is the yoke spring. And the way that Rolex does the keyless work is almost identical to other Swiss watch companies. This uh, came fairly naturally to me. Um, 
based on my experience working on other ones. The difference is the quality of parts. Again, look at that yoke spring. Do you see how thick that is? It is beefy. I mean, it has a beveled edge on it. That thing is the real deal. Normally, these parts are just stamped. They're just stamped out of metal and they're fine. I mean, look, they don't need to be super crazy. But again, this is kind of what I mean when I say overbuilt, right? They, they took the time to say, you know what? We're going to build a part that is robust, that will last forever for its given purpose. Here, I'm greasing the winding stem. And I can appreciate that. You know, when, when you first get into collecting watches, most people think that Rolex is the best. And then you get in and you kind of realize that Rolex is kind of like they mass produce watches. So they're kind of everywhere. And you kind of go, eh, maybe Rolex isn't so cool. I like these, these other things more. And then as you are around watch people in the watch world more, you kind of get a respect for Rolex where you go, you know what? They do a really good job. These are super high quality watches that are real simple. They're straightforward. You know, they don't do any crazy complications and stuff like that. They're very usable day-to-day -day watches that you could wear and be happy with for a very long time. And there's a, there's a level of appreciation that you get for that kind of watchmaking. Again, the irony is, is that your average person thinks that it's a super fancy watch. You know, and, and it is. It's expensive, right? But <laughs> there's so many brands that produce, you know, kind of delicate, fancy uh, dress watches or whatever that aren't Rolex at all. Uh, Rolex tend to be much more on the sporty, robust, beefy side of things. But your average person doesn't know that. Yeah, so this one was quite a project for me as well with those two, the missing parts and then the broken parts. You know, I had to send away for those. They took a while to come in. So this one was like one of those ones where I'd get it on the bench, get rolling on it. I'm going to admit I was intimidated by it a bit, not only because of the cost of the watch. Uh, it was expensive. I had to sell another watch to get it, but also because I had never worked on a Rolex before. And when you kind of get rolling and feel like you're figuring it out and then a part breaks or you lose one, it's really frustrating. You're just like, oh, this is never going to come together but I finally kind of got back on track with it. Now, I'm applying a little bit of grease here to the high friction point parts of the uh, keyless works. So now it's time to uh, clean the cap jewels. And as you can see, I got it on the microscope here and they're pretty dirty underneath. So what I do is carefully remove these, put them in a solution called one dip which is a solvent, which will take any dirt or oil that's still on there off of it. Then I separate them and reminding you that they are absolutely minuscule. And I put a tiny drop of oil on the cap jewel and then put the bottom of the setting back in. And then I grab that whole thing and drop it back into here. And, and that's, how you, that's how you do these. It's very, very small work. It is absolutely tiny. I mean, I usually have to use a microscope or at least my powerful loop to do it. But as you can see, it pops right back in and then that's called an Inca block uh, jewel setting. So that means that if you drop your watch, that spring will move rather than uh, it breaking the pivot underneath. And that brings us to the bottom half of it. And as you can see, that's what the the jewel looks like right there. That's the cap jewel. And <laughs> so what this is, is this is a replacement cap jewel because while working on it, I had it in my tweezers and I was attempting to put oil on it and it pinged away. And normally it just flies, you know, a, a few inches away. This time I lost it. I searched everywhere and I could not find it and I had to send away for another part for this watch. And this one was totally on me, but it was another setback and another, all right, wait another week or two for this part to come in. And I finally got it and there it is. It fits like a charm, thankfully. And I've got it uh, oiled up and I can now put the, uh, the setting on, but this, this watch at this point has become a saga. I mean, it is, that is now the third replacement part that I've had to order for 
uh, various reasons, mainly uh, <laughs> relating to my skill, my current skill <laughs> as a watchmaker. <laughs> but uh, frustrating nonetheless. And there it is, seated back in its place. Now, that's the one dip right there. So I'm going to put the... Uh, the pallet fork and then the balance in it as well to give it a thorough cleaning. And I kind of agitate it there and then it's time to take the parts out. One dip is a very powerful solvent and it'll take off most of any oil or dirt that was left over on it at all. And it dissolves fairly quickly too. So I just use the blower here to, uh, to dry it. And that means that the pallet fork can go on. Now we're kind of starting to get up towards the moment of truth. Now, the watch did want to run before, even with that screw in there. So I feel pretty confident that this one will too. But uh, there's just something about this, this part of the process. It's easily the most exciting part of putting back together a watch is to see if it's going to work. And then, of course, how well it will work. So there we go. We've got the pallet fork carefully put back into place. Very delicate pivot. And now what I'm going to do is wind up the watch a little bit because the pallet fork will hold the power in the watch. And as you can see, it'll, it should just sort of tick over when I touch it. And it does. All right, so here's the big moment. Let's get the balance out. It's always tricky to get it to seat correctly. And there it goes. All right. So we have ourselves a running watch and it actually looks like it's running fairly healthy at this point too. Though that's just eyeballing it. When, when people say that, when you hear a watchmaker say that, they're talking about the amplitude. That's basically how much power is getting from the mainspring to the balance. And the, the way you know that is how much is that balance swinging? Does it look like it's being tossed back and forth with good force or is it kind of lazily going back and forth? And this looks pretty good to me. Now, off camera, I did lubricate the pallet jewel. It's just, I haven't found a way to actually record that, but I did do that. And now it's time to put on the automatic work again. And this is kind of a tricky thing because you need those gears to engage, but I learned a little trick from watching Mark Lovick over at the Watch Repair channel who uh, I've mentioned before here, but, uh, you know, he's somebody that's uh, an inspiration, I think, for, for anybody doing watchmaking. I, I took his classes and I recommend them. Um, but I did notice that he was working on a Rolex that was an automatic once, and he actually just turned the winding stem a little bit to get it to engage with the automatic part of the watch. And so I did that, and it worked like a trick. So now I'm just checking to make sure that when I turn it, that those gears turn, and then that turns the watch. And as you can see, it does. Such a cool device, an automatic winding. It, it, when you tell people that you don't have to wind your watch and that it does it automatically using gravity and the, <laughs> the force from your hand moving around, people are like, what? And especially when they realize how old that technology actually is. All right, it's time to put the dial back on. And the dial's held on by a couple of screws on the side. And now what I'm doing is getting the hands, even though they're not on there yet, at midnight. And you know it's midnight because that's when the date starts to tick over. Now, it probably should just tick over from one number to the next. And I'm not sure exactly why it didn't just jump all the way over. As you can see here, it does jump over a little while later but it doesn't quite click over. So that's something that I may look to look at in the future. But for now, 
I'm pretty happy to have this watch back together and working because it, the date doesn't stay halfway. It just takes another hour or something for it to jump all the way over. And sometimes it does jump over. So I leave it for now. But again, I need to get it right on to midnight so that I can put this minute hand on so that the hands cross the indices at the correct time. That looks pretty good. Again, I can just test to make sure that the date wants to turn over at exactly midnight. And there it goes. And as you can see, it goes at midnight as well. Now, I'm gonna put the seconds hand on, but that one, you don't actually have to line it up with anything uh, specific. It's always a little tricky because the pinion's so small, but if you're patient, it'll go on. And then just a gentle push with the uh, hand setting tool there and off it goes. Beautiful. And I'm just using a little bit of Rotico here just to get any dust particles that maybe have settled or maybe even that were already on the case. Um, I can just see a couple little smudges, and I find that the Rotico can be useful to just clean that up slightly. I'm using an air blower to make sure that there's no dust on the inside of the dial. That would drive me absolutely nuts if there was dust in there after I put it on. Of course, I need to take out the winding stem again to get the watch back in the case. I have to say this watch is looking quite nice. It cleaned up beautifully and uh, kind of excited to wear it. sure the winding stem is properly installed here. I use one of these rubber balls to put the uh, case backs on. You can actually get them quite tight with it, much easier than with your hand. I do have a case back removal tool that's bigger, but there it is. A Rolex Datejust, one of its most simple watches, but it's absolutely gorgeous and I couldn't be happier with it. You can see why it's such a popular watch for so long. Now, there is still the question, though, of how is it performing now that it's actually running and been serviced, hopefully close, approximating properly. And the answer is pretty darn good. Uh, within two to five seconds a day, 264 degrees of amplitude is strong and no beat error at all. So, great. I'm <laughs> definitely happy with that. That's just a great running little watch. So there you have it, the Rolex Datejust. This is the first time I've ever worked on a Rolex and I don't think it'll be my last, at least I hope not. In the end, this was a journey. Uh, I, it tested my patience, no doubt about it. Uh, multiple times I had to send away for parts um, and wait for them to come in the mail. Uh, the frustration uh, with that, of course, is, is pretty high. Uh, in the moment, but this is one of the beautiful things about watchmaking or really any hobby worthwhile. It's that it'll challenge you, but it's worth it in the end and you get that great satisfaction of having 
a beautiful working timepiece at the end, at least in the case for watchmaking. So I'm going to go enjoy my, uh, my date just. I want to thank you for hanging out and watching this video here on Wristwatch Revival. There are plenty of other ones for you to check out. And I'm also on Instagram at wristwatch underscore revival. I hope to see you there and we'll see you next time.